The health of too many indigenous Canadians in this country is terrible, and one reason for the lack of good health is the lack of wealth. And so a philanthropist named Michael Dan had an idea. If he could make indigenous Canadians living on reserves wealthier, might that make them healthier too? Let's find out. Joining us now, Michael Dan, president of the Gemini Power Corporation, and Phil Fontaine, former Grand Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, now Special Advisor to the Royal Bank of Canada, among many other private sector entities. And it's great to have both of you gentlemen here in our studio tonight. Good to be here. I want to start by reading something, Michael, that you and Sandra Romain wrote in the Globe and Mail last year, and this will set up the discussion to come. Here it goes. The effects of isolation on access, transportation, and human resource capacity influence every aspect of First Nations life. Living conditions are abysmal, with more than half of all houses in need of repair and or contaminated with mold, and a third of homes without potable water. Fewer than half of adults on Ontario First Nations have completed high school, and unemployment rates are more than double those for non-Aboriginals. The average personal income of those living on reserves is less than half that of non-Aboriginals. Health indicators mirror these conditions. With chronic and infectious disease rates well above non-Aboriginal averages, mental health issues and substance abuse are identified by Aboriginal adults as the most important issues plaguing their communities and result in loss of lives, productivity, and community well-being. That's you and Sandra Romain in the Globe last year. I want to start here, Michael Dan. You're a philanthropist, if I may say, with a lot of money. You could be spending it on any number of different important causes in this country that need attention. What was it about the Aboriginal experience in Canada that made you say, here's where I want to plant my flag and make a difference? I think it's because it's the Aboriginal experience in Canada. It is our backyard. It is a, a third world community right in our right on our doorstep. And I think that's that's where I mean, that's a logical place to begin. You're from Manitoba originally? My family is originally from Manitoba. Uh, I'm originally from the Toronto General Hospital. <laughs> okay. But your ancestors came from Manitoba, so perhaps had experiences with Aboriginal communities going way back. They, they did actually, and my, my grandfather, uh, Harry Hentelev, had many enjoyable hunting and fishing experiences uh, sort of on the Manitoba, Ontario border as a, as a young man. And this translated into uh, a love for the outdoors and canoeing uh, that's passed on to the generations in my family. Hmm. How did you, former Grand Chief, get to know this guy? Well, uh, we've known each other now for some time. Um, Bernie Farber, a dear friend, uh, and to me and Dr. Dan, introduced uh, uh, us and uh, we had mutual interests uh, and uh, uh, we knew people uh, that were friends of, of both and uh, it just seemed like a good fit and uh, so we've been uh, collaborating now for, for some time. On what? Well. Um, Small hydro development projects, uh, resource development generally, uh, many discussions around uh, the uh, more pressing challenges facing First Nation communities, poverty, uh, substance abuse, uh, and uh, I mean, we were both uh, strong supporters of uh, Chief Theresa Spence and her actions on Victoria Island, and in fact, we, we paid her a visit, and uh, we've... Uh, We've been anxious and concerned about a lot of the challenges that have faced our First Nation community over, over years and uh, uh, situations and problems that seem intractable. But and as a result of our conversations and discussions, we feel that there are uh, a whole number of good opportunities before us. We just have to uh, do things right. Let me follow up, because you called him Dr. Dan. People should know, you're a former neurosurgeon, right? Uh, that's correct, yes. And why did you stop doing that? Uh, we sold a family business, and uh, so I had a decision to make whether I continue on as a neurosurgeon and let other people invest my money, or whether I uh, take a crack at losing it myself. And uh, <laughs> that's what I decided to do. Um, but going back to your opening statement, you know, you, we, we hear this every day, and, and it's part of, you know, the. It's in the atmosphere, and, and yet every word of that statement is true. And, and there's a tendency to dismiss it as hysteria, but in fact what's happening uh, in the Aboriginal communities in Canada is a sort of a demographic 
and public health time bomb. It's a ticking time bomb. Um, most people don't even know Aboriginal Canadians are made up of three populations, First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis. They're, the total number is about 1.4 million uh, today. Um, when I was born in 1960, it was about 220,000. I'm just quoting Government of Canada statistics. So that's a sevenfold increase. Yeah, it's the fastest demographic, it, growing demographic yes, in the country. So 4.3 percent, and in, in some parts of the country, uh, the northern Saskatchewan and parts of Manitoba, the, the numbers are huge. And, and everything that um, fiat currencies and fractional reserve banking has done to create wealth in the non-Aboriginal community hasn't happened. Uh, especially among First Nations, and, and that's because of some very fundamental rules of economics. So they, they don't own their own homes. Against most, most Canadians don't know that. They literally do not own the homes that they live in. They don't own the land on the reserve. So these are economic vehicles of wealth creation that uh, were available to my family when, when we first came to Canada 100 years ago, and we did very well because you, know, you could buy a house and pay off the mortgage. Uh, over 20 years or 30 years and then sell it and, and, and have a capital gains. And that mechanism of wealth creation is denied to, to First Nations. So they're literally stuck in this cycle of poverty for systemic reasons. It's not because they, they lack the capacity or the intelligence, but they lack the, the, the structural mechanism for creating wealth. I want to follow up on something else Chief Fontaine said a moment ago, which is the resource development that you're involved in. Can you just take a moment and explain how you are trying to create resource development on reserves that could create in future a you know, quasi-permanent revenue stream for reserves to get them out of poverty? How does that so, work? In addition to being a philanthropist and a neurosurgeon, I'm also a hydroelectric developer. <laughs> and it would, it would take a long time to explain how I got into this business, but uh, hydroelectric generating stations, if you, they last about 100 years. If you build one, take care of it well, it's going to last 100 years. So I'm not going to last 100 years. I have no desire to own a hydroelectric station beyond my natural lifetime. And in fact, it's possible to build one and finance it in such a way that I can own it for 20 years and earn a very respectable rate of return. And then after that, somebody else can own it. So what we're trying to do at Gemini Power, and, and we haven't Again, you have to be very patient as a hydroelectric developer. It takes 10 years, all the, all the regulations you have to go through. We're very close, but we haven't built the thing because we don't have all the final permissions. But the idea is very simple. We're going to build a hydro station in northwestern Ontario on the traditional territory of the Lac La Croix First Nation. We will own it for 20 years. We'll receive the revenue from that. We'll share some of the revenue with the community. And then after 20 years, we hand them the keys and we say, here's a $40 million facility. It'll be owned by this community. And the $2 million a year that it's going to generate in revenue, that'll go straight to the community. What Soccer. will they have to pay for it? Nothing. You'll give it to them? After 20 years, yes. That's, that's the concept. And you can do it with a project like a hydroelectric project because they last for so long. There's just no need for me to own it for, for more than 20 years. Do you think this will work? It's working in other areas. Uh, you know, take the uh, Moose Factory First Nation in Northern Ontario. They bought, uh, they've acquired 25% uh, equity uh, in four dams. And uh, their revenue uh, stream is guaranteed for, uh, for years to come. And uh, this uh, investment uh, is going to transform their community. How so? Uh, I think well, it's already transforming the community. Yeah, I've well. spoken to people from the community and they say it's already had a transformative effect on this community. So now, wearing my other hat, public health, one of the main determinants of health status is, is socioeconomic status. So all the money that we're spending maintaining the health of First Nations communities, uh, detoxification and uh, social services, and, and it's just the list goes on and on and on. We could save money on the back end if we invested it up front to create wealth in these communities, like, like among the Moose Cree. And, and you can see it unfold before your eyes, how, how people's uh, sense of well-being and pride improves and they eat better and they take care of themselves and, and so the health costs downstream are reduced so you actually save money. I mean it's a very right-wing idea actually. <laughs> and they use their own money plus board the rest. 
It's a significant uh, investment on the part of the Moose Cree people, but they knew uh, the numbers were right. Uh, it was uh, uh, an economic dis uh, opportunity, and uh, they did the right thing. And as Dr. Dan said, uh, corrected my uh, my uh, my point. It's making a difference. And there are other uh, First Nation communities that have taken. Uh, a similar position in northern Manitoba, where one of the communities owns one third position, one third position in a, in a new dam, new, other dams coming on stream that are also going to see significant equity positions uh, acquired by First Nation communities where the development is taking place. If this and, is such a no brainer, though, it's a win win, why does it take 10 years for this thing to happen? Well, it's, uh, it's become a, a steep learning curve for us. I mean, um, the relationship between the private sector uh, and First Nation communities wasn't a healthy one for years and years. The courts have intervened. There have been in the order of uh, 180 favorable court decisions, court decisions in the last number of years uh, that speak to, among other things, uh, this legal requirement to consult meaningfully with First Nation communities to accommodate Aboriginal interests and in both to lead to reconciliation. So industry has come to learn that it's not business as, as usual, mm -hmm. right? It's, there's been a paradigm shift. Now our people are talking about equity, they're talking about joint ventures, they're talking about partnerships, they're talking about ownership. And, uh, and keep in mind that in the next decade, it's been estimated that there will be in the order of $650, $650 billion worth of investment on resource projects, mining, oil and gas, pipelines, hydro development. Much of that activity, economic activity, is going to take place on our lands. So the wealth is in the ground on mm -hmm. Aboriginal lands, First Nations lands. And so there's an opportunity here to uh, uh, transform uh, Canada, not just First Nation communities, to, and, and through that the transformation, tackle some of these serious challenges that Dr. Dan uh, has noted. I wonder if I could take you back, because when you approached various First Nations and said, I've got this idea to create a permanent revenue stream for you going forward, wh why did they not slam the door in your face? Because uh, my hunch is in Canadian history, there have been several times where white man has gone to First Nations and said, boy, have I got a good business idea for you and it hasn't worked out so well. I don't know, maybe I'm more persuasive than, uh, than other developers. Uh, you know, the, the history of the relationship with, with the Lac La Croix, it happened over time. Um, and it took, it took a long time to build trust uh, with the community. They were, you know, they're, they're unique, not unique, but they're, they're unusual in that they're, there's, they're just the right size where there's a lot of unity within the community. There aren't a lot of different factions. Everyone knows that, that they're you know, up against the wall and that something had to be done to, to develop the economy. So it was, it was more a lucky coincidence uh, than anything else that we got together. I might ask you the same question. Why didn't they slam the door in his face, given the history? Well, Dr. Dan is a pretty easy guy to, to like. <laughs> and uh, his pitch is, uh, is pretty persuasive. And uh, I mean, you have to remember that he, he left a, a, a pretty uh, significant practice and uh, he's going to invest his money, uh, his own money in um, projects that uh, make sense not just to him, but to the communities that uh, he's established a relationship with. He understands the, uh, the situation of Aboriginal people. He knows the story. He's well aware, for example, and very sensitive about the residential school experience. He knows the opportunities out there. He knows that we're the fastest growing population in Canada, four and a half times the national average. We're a young population, 50% of our population is under the age of uh, 25. He knows that there's been a significant migration from reserve communities to urban, uh, urban communities. and. Uh, he knows what drives the economy, and uh, he, he understands uh, uh, this uh, deeply. And uh, most importantly, he wants to make a difference. 
And two, he respects our people. He respects Aboriginal people. He, he knows and respects our traditions and ceremony. And there are many, many communities, First Nation communities in Canada, where ceremony and traditions, culture, language, are of critical importance. And Dr. Dan has demonstrated how, that. How long are you going to talk about yeah. me like this? <laughs> well, he <laughs> mentioned money. How much of your money are you putting into this? I've already put in a significant amount. Yeah, give us a number. Millions of dollars. Millions as in the seven figures or eight figures? Uh, well, under, under 10. Under 10 million. But that's still a and, pretty healthy chunk. Uh, let me ask you this. You don't have to read, you don't have to go too far back in newspapers to read a lot of stories about how even when First Nations uh, do have a healthy bottom line, there are governance issues and the money is not always uh, well spent. How concerned are you that you may have created a permanent revenue stream here for various First Nations, but that the money won't be well spent? Um, I, I think about it, and so quite a bit. And, and that's why I have a, and maybe this is the key for other developers or other businesses, I don't know, but I have a very personal relationship with the La Croix community. Uh, we've taken to each other um, in, a, in a very touching ceremony, the elders of the community presented me with an eagle feather so that I would have strength, and I, which I found was you know, very moving but kind of ironic because I'm the guy from Toronto with millions of dollars. You know, I don't need the strength, but they, they have nothing. And yet they gave me this eagle feather. And, and that's like being given an honorary doctorate degree in, in their culture. I mean, it is not, you know, you can't, you can't buy an eagle feather on eBay. You can't get, you know, you have to be given one by an elder because it's illegal to possess parts of an eagle unless you're a First Nation. And uh, I have uh, Anishinaabe names as well. And, and I, uh, well, I have a couple. So the, the first name they gave me, I don't think I should tell you because it's a sacred ceremonial name. Okay. The second name is Wakibines, which means radiant thunderbird. And uh, members of my family now have Aboriginal names and eagle feathers. And so my expect, I mean, I'm answering your question in a long way, but my expectation is, have, is to have a continuing lifelong relationship with this community, a relationship of trust and respect. And when I, when I see them at the threshold of, of having wealth, you know, maybe I'll offer some advice to them on, on how to invest it, how to spend it, how to, you know, it's, it's very, I'm part of their circle. This, you have to understand the First Nations society. They're, many of our Canadian institutions have incorporated and absorbed their values unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And the, the ever-expanding circle of inclusion, that is a First Nation concept. And so I've been in, in, invited into their circle, not their inner inner circle, but you know, their, their circle of governance. So it's a huge privilege. And you think you can have an impact? I, I believe I'm having an impact, and as long as I'm truthful and, and uh, you know, follow the seven grandfather teachings, then hmm. they will continue to respect me. I don't mean to single out First Nations for governance issues. Obviously, we have our share of gas plants and e-health and all of that business in the uh, non-Aboriginal well, community. There are many lessons that we can draw from. Yes. Governments, yes. Uh, private sector uh, uh, situations, there have been many, with banks, uh, you know, that have failed and uh, Precisely. so on and so so forth. So uh, it's, a, it's a challenge that's not uh, entirely unique to our, our communities. I mean, the, we've been uh, challenged many times over transparency and accountability-related accountability issues, but in my view that uh, they've made too much of that because in the main, uh, we, we've managed uh, very scarce resources very effectively, and uh, we haven't received enough credit for the, the kind of job that most uh, First Nation government leaders have, uh, have done to demonstrate uh, their, their commitment and their capability uh, to be not just transparent and accountable, but visionary in the approach that they bring to uh, very difficult issues. Okay, but do you worry that reserves which may have been dirt poor for decades and decades and suddenly see this multi-million dollar revenue stream coming in, that's a lot of money very quick. Well, uh, we've, we have uh, many examples where First Nations uh, have done exceptionally well in managing these resources. Fort Mackay in uh, northern Alberta, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, 
revenue stream now is uh, in the order of $700 million a year. Their community is just, uh, uh, just a vibrant place. It's a healthy, safe uh, community. In my view, the single biggest challenge faced by Canada is First Nations poverty. And uh, Paul Martin agrees with you. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of people do. Uh, and in fact, uh, I mean, I, I'm a great admirer of uh, the Right Honourable Paul Martin, and uh, I think uh, the approach that he wanted to take, but addressing the, the gap in the quality of life, uh, the poverty gap, uh, was uh, visionary, and it would have made a real difference. It's uh, indeed unfortunate that it was cast aside. As it, has, it set us back. We're trying to stay out of politics in this discussion. <laughs> anyway, I've got time for one more question and I want to ask it to you. And that is, there is an expression that no good deed goes unpunished. H has that happened here yet? Well, I've, uh, I think the, the, the sort of punishment I'm living through now is a type of purgatory, a regulatory purgatory. <laughs> um, you know, the, the project in La Clacroix is, is a concept right now. And I'm hoping to actually work with the, the School of, of Public Health at the University of Toronto and, and measure the outcomes, the impact um, of wealth creation on health determinants later on. The purgatory is a kind of a bureaucratic, regulatory, red tape purgatory because no, no one in Ontario has done this before. And so that's, that's the punishment I'm facing at the moment. But it'll get done eventually. I'll get through purgatory. How long is it going to take? <laughs> I told you, it's a 10 year ten years in, cycle. 10 years maybe, in purgatory. Maybe one or two more years, and, and we'll have a shovel in the ground, I'm hoping. You're Jewish. Do you believe in purgatory? <laughs> Anything that works, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I wish you well, both of you. Thank you. Michael Dan, Phil Fontaine, it's good to have both of you in at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.